In our last lecture, we looked at the nature of space in both Isaac Newton's classical theory and the relativistic theory of Albert Einstein. In the next two lectures, we'll look at the philosophical questions that arise from the nature of time. There are three main questions to consider. One is the direction of time. Why is the past unlike the future? Two is time travel. Are we stuck surfing the wave of time, or is it possible to swim through it? The third is the origin of time. Was there a start to time, and what came before that? This lecture will consider the first two, and we'll save the third one for next, yes, next time. Now, the verb we most naturally use in describing our common sense view of time is flow. Time flows like a mighty river, flowing in one direction. It carries us and everything else along at a constant rate, powered by its own internal nature. This is Newton's view. Just like his picture of absolute space, Newton also thought there was absolute time. Absolute true and mathematical time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equably without relation to anything external, and by another name is called duration. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequable, measure of duration by means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. There's relative time. How many ticks of the clock have passed, or how many times has the sun risen? But these are not real time. According to Newton, time, like space, is a thing unto itself, with a nature and properties. One of those properties is that it flows. The thing about flowing is that it's directional. There's upstream and downstream, and these are absolute directions. With time, there is earlier, and there is later, and they are different. The future and the past seem to us to be completely different. We can remember the past, but not the future. We can change the future, but not the past. According to Newton, this is because of the nature of time. But Newton's laws of motion are not time directional. If you reverse the direction of time, his laws still work the same. Watch a movie. Newton's laws will explain what you see. Now run it backwards. Newton's laws hold for that backwards world, too. Newton wants to have time with a direction, but his laws don't pick it out. And it isn't just Newton. The same sort of time reversal holds for relativity. Einstein's mechanics, his laws of motion, replace Newton's, but both share this time symmetry. We think time has a direction, but our theories about time don't show it. Is there, in the physical world, something that breaks this symmetry? any theory that is time-directional. Hans Reichenbach, the former student of Einstein and leader of the logical empiricists in Berlin, pointed out in his book, The Arrow of Time, that there is one place where we see time-directionality, thermodynamics, the physics of heat. If one were to show a movie of a person kicking a football, it obeys the laws of mechanics, both forwards and backwards. But now, make a movie of someone toasting a piece of bread. Toasting is what we call an irreversible reaction. Take a piece of bread, stick it in the toaster, then put it in the freezer. What comes out is not the original piece of bread, but frozen toast. We have an asymmetry in physics. But this is weird. Heat, after all, is just motion. The 19th century British physicist James Clerk Maxwell gave us the kinetic theory of heat. Matter, he argued, is made up of molecules. Those molecules are in motion. The temperature of a thing is just a measure of the average energy of motion, kinetic energy, of those molecules. But the motion of molecules is just motion. This motion should follow the mechanics of, of Newton or Einstein, and those are both time-reversible. When we film the movie of someone toasting bread, if we look close enough, it's the same movie as someone kicking a football, just that it's a bunch of tiny little footballs. But the size shouldn't matter. The system obeys the same fundamental laws, and those laws are time reversible. And so, frozen toast should be impossible. Now, you'd be right if you pointed out that the toasting of bread is a chemical reaction, not just a physical one. There are bonds between molecules that change, among other things. 
But the idea is that there do seem to be processes that are non-reversible, that is, that pick out a direction of time. One place in thermodynamics where this is embodied, Reichenbach points out, is the infamous second law of thermodynamics. Now, there's much confusion about the second law. It does not say that the universe always becomes increasingly disordered. It's certainly possible to increase order within a system. Consider the bedroom of my teenage son. It is possible to return this room to a state of order. That is, he could clean his room. How? By expending energy. But if, as too often happens, he fails to expend the necessary energy, what happens to the room? It likely becomes more disordered, although there is a chance the opposite will happen. The shirt, carelessly tossed in the direction of the hamper, might happen to go in. This would be an increase in order. But it probably won't land in the hamper. There are a whole bunch of other locations in the room where it could end up. By landing in any of these other places where a dirty shirt should not go, this is an increase in disorder. The second law does not say that disorder will increase, but that over time, the number of possible states the room could be in will increase. Entropy is a measure of this number of possible states. Reichenbach argues that this tendency for entropy to increase could be seen to differentiate future from past because decreasing entropy requires actions that have effects. Cause and effect relations also seem to have a preferred direction. Causes have to come before effects. We should be able to follow the causal chains to see the privileged direction of time. This answer requires a full accounting of the notions of cause and effect, something that has been thorny in the history of philosophy, but Reichenbach does his best. Not everyone, however, has been convinced. Objecting to this line is Hugh Price, the Bertrand Russell professor at Cambridge University, in his book, Time's Arrow and Archimedes' Point. Price contends that the sort of cause-based entropy argument that Reichenbach advances doesn't work. To answer the question of the direction of time, Reichenbach thinks we need to answer the question, why does entropy increase? But think about what you explain. You don't explain normal, that's just how things are. You explain abnormal, why are things different? What's normal is disorder, high entropy, lots of possible states for things to be in. What's strange is order. The second law of thermodynamics says that for systems that are closed, that is, those in which no new energy is added, tend towards a greater number of possible states. The thing we need to explain is not the increasing disorder, but what happened to make it ordered to begin with. Order in nature is weird, and if things are tending to disorder, they're becoming more normal. We have to explain abnormal, and so the real question of time's direction hinges on an explanation of the order of the early universe. We know that the universe is expanding. We see that from the shifting of the color of light from galaxies we observe. An expanding universe used to be smaller, used to have fewer possible states. In such a universe, entropy is increasing. But if there's enough matter in the universe, the force of gravitation would be strong enough to stop the expansion and cause a universal contraction. This shrinking of the universe would limit the number of possible states things could be in. In other words, this empirical possibility, which is in perfect accord with our best theory of physics, could very well lead to a universe where entropy tends to decrease. This means that we can't hang our philosophical hat on entropy if we're looking for an intrinsically time-directional basis in physics. Physics has made it perfectly possible that entropy would be incapable of doing what we need it to do. Hence, we're back at our starting point. Why, other than it seems to us, should we think that time flows in one special direction? Indeed, should we even believe it flows at all? Professor Price occupies the Bertrand Russell chair at Cambridge. When Russell himself was at Cambridge, one of his best friends was the philosopher John McTaggart Ellis McTaggart. 
McTaggart is best remembered for his distinction between two conceptions of time, which he sets out in his famous article, The Unreality of Time. McTaggart labels these A-time and B-time. In A-time, we're fixed observers with time flowing past us. A-time has three metaphysically different realms. There's the past. These are moments that are fixed and gone. There's the present, which is now and experienced. And there's the future, which is open and has not yet come to be. We are like the slider of a zipper. Moments of time are like the teeth of the zipper. The teeth that have gone through us are set and fixed. The ones that have not yet gone through are disjointed and removed from each other. We are the thing that changes one to the other. This is a time in which there are three completely different sorts of time. In a time, we are fixed and time flows past us. In B time, on the other hand, time is fixed and we move through it. History is an interconnected block of unchanging temporal relations. The future is just as fixed as the past. Time doesn't change, human consciousness does. We only remember the past, not the future. This is not because there's anything different about past and future, but because there's something different about us. Think about a movie being played on a DVD player. The beginning, middle, and end of the movie are all on the disc. They're all fixed. While watching the film, we don't know how the movie ends. Not because the future of the film is undetermined, but because we haven't seen it yet. The reader moves across the disc and projects one shot at a time on the screen, creating a difference to our consciousness between what we have seen, are seeing, and haven't yet seen. But there's no metaphysical difference between them. This is B time. The two are incompatible. Although McTaggart argues that aspects of both are essential to any successful philosophical account of time. As such, he concludes, the notion of time is, in itself, self-contradictory, and thus an illusion. McTaggart was an idealist. That is, he thought there is no material reality, only a realm of consciousness. Few people hold this view, but by doing away with time, he thought he was taking a significant step in dissolving the external material world. The vast majority of philosophers of physics reject the metaphysical project of McTaggart, but the distinction between A-time and B-time has remained, because even if there is a material world, we still have to understand which model is actually descriptive of its time. While McTaggart's distinction was in no way influenced by Einstein, we will need to add relativity to the discussion because there are a couple of interesting temporal effects there. And these will lead to the question of time travel. So, for Newton, time is absolute. God wears the divine Rolex, and all of reality is divided up into absolute time slices. That is, three-dimensional spaces arranged in an absolute order. Think of a film. Not the movie you watch, but the film itself on the reel that would go through the projector. It was a long strip comprised of individual frames. Each frame is the entirety of space, and the order of the frames is the entirety of time for the movie. Film space is absolute, because for each thing we can say exactly how far something is over and up from the bottom left-hand corner of the frame in which it appears. And time is absolute, because we can say exactly how many frames into the movie it is. Space and time are both absolute and independent. Einstein knew this concept of space was wrong. His hero, H. A. Lawrence, had described the way lengths contract for moving observers. But no one understood why this happened. Indeed, pretty much everyone, including Lawrence himself, thought it was a quirk of math. It didn't really happen. But Einstein took the math seriously. The transformation equation said it did, so that's what the physics tells us about the world. But why? He took a long walk in the mountains with a friend, thinking about this question. He took the train back home to Bern. Glancing over his shoulder at the clock on the train station as he walked away from it, it hit him. The clock does not show what time it is. The clock shows what time it was. To read the clock, light bounces off the clock and travels to your eye. 
but he was walking away from the clock. The light would not only have to reach him, it would have to catch up with him to do it. If an observer moves away from the clock, the light would arrive slightly later. The faster he went, the more it would have to do to catch up to him. So the faster he walked away from the clock, the slower the clock would appear to move. Remember that Einstein at this point was under the spell of Ernst Mach's positivism. What is real is what's observable, what we measure. Time is what the clock tells us it is. So if the clock is moving slower for moving observers, then time itself slows when observers move. What Lawrence had done for length also needed to be done for duration. This was the key to the special theory of relativity. This effect is called time dilation. Time passes at different rates for different observers moving at different speeds. It was most colorfully illustrated by Einstein's friend, the French physicist Paul Langevin, with his famous twins paradox. Suppose we have two twins who are both 20 years old. One stays on Earth, while the other becomes an astronaut. The astronaut travels very fast for the duration of the mission, returning to Earth 20 Earth years later. The twin who was left on Earth will be 20 years older, that is, 40 years old. The twin stepping out of the rocket will only be 37 years old. The astronaut twin doesn't just look younger, but using a clock and a calendar would have only experienced 17 years in the same time the Earth-bound twin experienced 20. The passing of time is a relative measure. Einstein understood this. But he did not, however, fully understand the philosophically radical nature of the insight. After he published it, the paper was read by a mathematician turned physicist named Hermann Minkowski, who did understand exactly how radical it was. Minkowski recast the theory and delivered a famous talk on it called Space and Time in 1909, where he explains to Einstein and the world the true conceptual meaning of Einstein's theory, which is that no longer can space and time be thought of as independent elements as Newton conceived. Rather, they had to be thought of as united into a single four-dimensional space-time. This paper angered Einstein. He was furious. Minkowski was not just some random scholar, he was Einstein's college professor. And Einstein was not a great student. Einstein would frequently skip Minkowski's lectures. Einstein thought Minkowski's paper was written to shame Einstein. He thought that the mathematical rigor and elegance was intended to make Einstein feel stupid. He thought his former teacher was taking a theory that was clear and intuitive and making it impossible to understand. But eventually he settled down and realized how important Minkowski's work was. By explaining the theory geometrically, Minkowski showed the interrelation of space and time. This is what Einstein needed to develop the general theory of relativity in which gravitation is understood geometrically. Minkowski was one of the first physicists who understood and accepted the theory of relativity for the revolution that it was. When Einstein wrote it, he was a mere patent clerk, not a professor. No one thought that some no one could overthrow the most important theory in the history of humanity. But Minkowski did, and he was very excited to see where it went. Sadly, he soon died, and the work was left to his student Einstein and his best friend, David Hilbert, to continue. They did, and working along different lines, developed the general theory almost simultaneously. As we discussed in the last lecture, gravitation is understood as the curvature of space. But as Minkowski showed, space and time are not independent. Space and time are united into a single four-dimensional structure, space-time. It's space-time that warps. It should be thought of, using Einstein's wonderful metaphor, as a mollusk. Think of a squishy, slimy oyster. That's what space-time is like, not the rigid mass lying beneath reality that Newton had imagined. We are four-dimensional beings. In space-time, we're like veins flowing through the mollusk. We are world lines, tubes. Cut a thin slice out of the tube and you get a three-dimensional me. 
But from the four-dimensional perspective of space-time, each of us is a tube worming its way through. One person who understood this was the Austrian mathematician Kurt Gödel. He recognized that we're all just tubes in a squishy mollusk. And that was not weird enough for him. He wanted to think about how strange a shape we could make by squeezing the oyster in weird ways. He realized that if we distribute matter and energy in just the right way, then, according to general relativity, we could squish the mollusk into a shape that would cause a long enough tube to cross itself. But the tubes are things. They're four-dimensional representations of objects moving through space and time. Gödel showed that if you set up matter and energy in just the right alignment and had an electron moving fast enough, you could get space-time to warp so radically that the electron would bounce off its earlier self. It would collide with itself. Einstein's general theory of relativity predicts the possibility of time travel. And this opens the door to time machines, and that leads to the paradoxes of time travel. Of course, time machines would lead us to go back into the past and correct some of humanity's biggest mistakes, the Holocaust, atomic weapons, sidebirds and bell-bottoms. But this leads to concerns about what philosophers call reverse causation. When we say that A causes B, we have to assert at least that A comes before B the cause is earlier than the effect. But if we allow time travel, then the cause of anything we would change would be from something that was actually after the effect. Time travel allows for the changing of the direction of the causal arrow. The big problem, of course, is when the effect of this reverse causation eliminates the preconditions necessary for the cause to exist in the first place the problem of going to the past and killing your own grandfather. But doing that would mean we would not have existed. And if we didn't exist, we couldn't act, but you did act, you killed your grandfather. Time travel implies that we both can and cannot kill our grandfather in the past. This is a contradiction, and contradictions cannot be. Since time travel led to the contradiction, it cannot be. And since Einstein's theory entails time travel, it too must be wrong. Have we just found a logical reason to reject the theory of relativity? Prominent philosopher David Lewis took this question seriously in his article, The Paradoxes of Time Travel. Consider Tim, whose grandfather was an immoral but very successful weapons developer whose work caused great suffering. Tim was wealthy from the blood money acquired from his grandfather and used his wealth to develop a time machine to go back and kill his grandfather before he could invent the weapons that would lead to mass death. Tim also trained as a sniper and became incredibly talented. Tim had a perfectly functioning rifle. Tim had a clear day and a clear shot. Tim had perfect lighting and good vision. Tim had his grandfather in the crosshairs. Can Tim pull the trigger and kill his own grandfather? The answer, Lewis contends, is yes and no. Tim can kill his grandfather, and Tim cannot kill his grandfather. So, this is a contradiction, right? Wrong. It only appears to be a contradiction. What saves us is the word can. The word has two different meanings in two seemingly contradictory claims. To illustrate this, Lewis asks us to think about the difference between him, a Princeton professor, and a gorilla. In doing so, he posits that one fundamental distinction between the two is that Lewis, but not the gorilla, can speak the Finnish language. Professor Lewis's brain and anatomical structures of the throat and mouth are different from his simian counterpart, so that he alone could speak the language of those from Finland. So in this way, David Lewis can be said to be able to speak Finnish. But it's also true that he was never taught or exposed to the language spoken in Finland. He knows none of the words, nothing of the grammatical structure, not even the accent. So, if he were on an airplane and a Scandinavian passenger had an emergency and a stewardess plaintively asked, 
Can anyone speak Finnish? He could not say, I can speak Finnish. It is true that Tim has the ability to make the shot. In that way, Tim can kill his grandfather. But because Tim is there, he cannot make the shot that kills his grandfather. Why not? The answer comes from McTaggart. When we envision time travel in our science fiction, we're implicitly thinking of a time. That's what makes the plot interesting. By getting in the time machine and going into the past, what I've done is not just show up back then, but rather something more philosophically radical. What I'm doing by inserting my present self into the past is to change the metaphysical properties of the moments I visit. Before I step into the time machine, the past, by being the past, is fixed. But when I go back in time and step out of the time machine, suddenly those instants of time that had been fixed because they were in the past are now in my present or in my future and therefore become unfixed. This is the source of the paradoxes and the misunderstanding. What Einstein's theory of relativity does for us is to assure us that we need to think of space-time as a consolidated whole, which forces us to a perspective exclusively tied to B-time. The time doesn't move past us. We move through it. Yes, it is conceivable, maybe even physically possible, to have paths through space-time that put an object, even an observer, at a progression of moments such that some would be temporarily earlier than others from most perspectives. As Gödel showed, there may even be interactions. These would be represented by closed loops in four-dimensional space-time. Such loops are possible. But the fact that there's a closed loop through time does not change the arrangements of the elements in time. If it did, there would be no loop. But the presupposition is that the loop exists. If the man Tim thinks is his grandfather is indeed his grandfather, something will happen to foil the assassination attempt. From the perspective of B-time, it must. The physics does not allow it. But while using the correct concept of time from McTaggart gets rid of this paradox, it doesn't make the situation normalized. There's still one philosophically odd element to the situation of time travel that Lewis points out. Within the time loop, each event is the effect of a cause. Each cause is another event in the loop. And following the loop linearly, the cause always is before the effect. But from outside the loop, there are effects that come before the cause. Going back in time did cause things, even though it couldn't change things. But now we can ask what caused the time loop? This can have no answer. While each event in the loop is caused, the loop itself is not. We have a curious space-time structure that's necessarily uncaused. To be caused is to be part of a forward-moving chain of events. But because of its shape, the loop is not part of a chain, but a self-contained loop. It, therefore, cannot be caused. How did he come up with that? I don't know. You invent the time machine and I'll go back and ask him. But now, it's on to our next lecture. Or is it our previous one?